Hello and welcome to the next event in the Institute for Government's Virtual Conservative Fringe Programme. This afternoon we'll be talking about learning lessons before launching an inquiry. I'm Emma Norris and I'm the Director of Research at the Institute for Government and this event is kindly supported by the British Psychological Society. Now the government's been clear that it wants to learn from what went wrong in the COVID-19 response and it's indicated that there will be a public inquiry, although government has said that it now is not the right time. For the next hour, we'll be discussing how government and indeed others should go about learning lessons from what has happened, both in advance of an inquiry and during the inquiry itself. And more generally, we'll be looking at how to manage accountability, learning lessons and blaming government. Some of the questions I'm hoping we'll explore are how should government and any organisation create the right conditions for learning lessons and maintaining trust, regardless of whether things have gone well or badly? What's the difference between lesson learning and holding people to account? And when, if ever, is it right to blame people for when things go wrong? Is the government right that a more detailed public inquiry should wait? Um, and is it possible to learn lessons while still in the grip of a crisis? We've got a fantastic panel with us today to discuss all those questions and more. We've got Sir Bernard Jenkin MP, who is currently chair of the Liaison Committee and previously chair of the Public Administration and Constitutional Affairs Committee. So he is very experienced in running select committee inquiries and in holding decision makers to account. We've got Sue Cameron, who's been a columnist for the FT and for The Telegraph, um, and she has written extensively on government politics and the Institute for Government's favourite topic, the civil service. Sue is a former presenter of Newsnight and The Week in Westminster. In Westminster. And we have Catherine Scott, um, Director of Policy at the British Psychological Society and a participant on government's Spy B group, which has been providing government with behavioural science advice during the pandemic. So we're going to start the event with some introductory remarks from our panel, then we'll have some discussion between the panel before opening up to questions sent in by the audience. So if you're watching, please start sending in your questions as soon as you have them. Um, you can submit questions via the Q&A function that you should be able to see on your screen. And you can also tweet about the event using the hashtag CPC20. This event is on the record and there will be a recording available afterwards. So without further ado, um, let's get going. Um, Bernard, I'm going to come to you first. You've been calling for an inquiry um, or lessons learned exercise into the pandemic and having chaired numerous high profile select committees yourself, you're used to running exercises examining government decision making. How should government go about learning lessons from the coronavirus inquiry both now and in the future? And what does this mean for the relationship between ministers and civil servants? And what's the role of parliament in lesson learning and accountability? Over to you. Well, thank you. And in just five minutes, I will try and cover all that. The highest performing organisations are those which are constantly learning from success as well as failure. Of course, much will be learned from a, a public inquiry in the future, but it can't be a substitute for learning lessons and adapting them while key events are unfolding. And I'd love to post something straight onto the chat, if I may. There's a fantastic example I've got from my local NHS. And can, you can just tell me how to do that. I'd be very grateful. The Integrated Care System for Suffolk and North East Essex has just published a document called Reflections on System Learning from COVID-19. How do I put that in the chat? Can you tell me? Anybody? How do I do that? There should be a chat function just at the bottom of your screen, Bernard. It should say private chat and you can put it in there. In there right? shall... Okay. If I shall put that there and people can have a look at it while I'm discussing it. Um, the, um, <clears throat> the key word is reflections. NHS England did not ask the local group to do this. Uh, so no other part of the NHS has produced anything of this quality. Um, reflecting upon their learning from the first stages of the pandemic alongside the more structured work necessary around the recovery plan of the NHS and local government. This was a joint enterprise of integ integrated care system leaders, trust leaders, local authorities and uh, local resilience uh, uh, forums. They asked them to share their reflections and any data they could and what they felt had been the challenges and opportunities that their achievements and regrets and their hopes and fears for the future and what they felt to be their key learning from the pandemic. Do look at least the executive summary of Reflections. It's a model of its kind. There's even a short film. Well, such learning could only take place in Whitehall if both ministers and civil servants were providing the right leadership. And Whitehall sorely needs to develop such leadership. Let me just that. Um, 
uh, surely needs to develop such leadership which can provide space and security for the saying of unwelcome truths. PACAC set this out in our report, uh, the minister and the official, the fulcrum of effectiveness of Whitehall. So much of the commentary about Whitehall concentrates on obvious failures and the solutions always appear to be about parachuting in outside talent or restructuring organisations. But questions about telling uncomfortable truths or developing the right kind of leadership are the discussion of those questions are, are the precondition for getting permanent improvement in every other area. Parliament must hold government to account, particularly through the scrutiny of select committees, but accountability is not an end in itself. It has a higher purpose and our voters know this. They lose faith in leaders uh, and resort to blame if they see no evidence of their being able to learn. They be the voters become less interested in blame if they can see steps are being taken to learn and to improve so previous mistakes and disasters are not repeated. Our oppositionist politics tends to resort to blaming and shaming, but blame discourages telling the truth because blame creates an atmosphere of fear and retribution. PASC and my, one of my previous committees took evidence about the three characteristics of a failing organization. First, everyone knows things are going wrong but can't talk about them for fear of blame. Second, there are lots of meetings to address things going wrong and things decided, um, but people leave those meetings and immediately confide in their colleagues something completely different like why it won't work. And third, those at the top of the organization are the last to know how bad things are. Blame is in fact the enemy of accountability. Whitehall needs to develop a doctrine of forward accountability without blame, of finding out the truth and the lessons to be learned from success and failure so that we can hold ministers and officials accountable for implementing those lessons into the future. Why does the air accident investigation branch of the Department of Transport work so well? Because its job is, and I quote, to explain the circumstances and causes of accidents and serious incidents without attributing blame, unquote. And that is why PASC and PACAC also championed the healthcare safety investigation branch of the Department of Health to do the same, learning from clinical incidents without blame. It is hard to achieve this sort of learning in any organization, particularly where it requires a change in culture. But voters would support this change and political leaders who are determined to provide forward accountability instead of retrospective blame will be better respected for it. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard. Um, lots of things I want to pick up on in there and questions in there. Um, Sue, I'm going to come to you next. You've been following politics in Whitehall for many years. You've written about the role of the civil service, the tension between good politics and good government. So how should government best respond to mistakes and learn? Uh, does politics get in the way of that? Is it right to blame people? And what does all this mean in the context of coronavirus? Well, I agree with practically everything that Bernard said, that I, I have to say. I think it's wonderful that um, the public inquiry, but one doesn't think the time is right. I tell you what, Sir Humphrey Appleby lives. They'd be, he'd be proud of them. Of course, the time is now for a, a, for a public inquiry of some kind with a strong chair and one which gets on and delivers, I would say, within six months. And the reason for that is that there's no point having an inquiry that eventually produces uh, uh, a, a report in five, six years time, as some uh, inquiries done do that, that what we need is something that looks at what has happened what is happening and produces recommendations that can be applied now, now when we're in the midst of the pandemic and we can actually improve things i do see that there is this supposed tension between holding people to account and to account and uh learning lessons but there shouldn't be not within the sort of normal use of the English language, holding people to account shouldn't mean blaming them. It has come to mean that, you know, we're, when we hold you to account, we're going to name the guilty men. But that isn't what holding to account should be. As Bernard said, it should be finding out what happened, who said what, what the evidence was, etc, etc. Not blame people. And particularly in the pandemic inquiry, there have been inquiries where there was plenty of blame to go round. I'm 
a rock inquiry with dodgy dossiers and uh, even dodgier uh, claims about weapons of mass destruction or the mid-staffs inquiry where people had been neglected. But this isn't remotely like that. It is not an inquiry where blame should be apportioned. And indeed, as Bernard said, I so agree with him, that once you start trying to blame people, uh, it just stops working and people stop uh, being forthcoming. So I think there should be um, a short, sharp inquiry with a tough chair. I think it should uh, report back in six months. There should be no lawyers. They should preferably have very few recommendations. I think there was one inquiry that had 290 or something, something ridiculous. Uh, and I think in a way there should be a sort of two prongs to the inquiry. And the first bit should be holding people to account and just asking what happened. Who was in the room when the decisions were made? Who was in the room? Who excluded? What was the evidence on which decisions were taken? Which were the forums where things were discussed? Um, what were the, is the evidence for some of the lockdown measures, the rule of six or the curfew? There are so many things where it is just a matter of finding out what happened and perhaps what didn't happen. Um, some people have pointed out, I think quite rightly, I think Gus O'Donnell, the former cabinet secretary, was saying something like this the other day, that um, uh, it wasn't just a COVID um, crisis that we've had, it's been a whole load of other crises. Um, health crises for those who are suffering from um, uh, cancer or heart disease, uh, it's been a social crisis, an educational crisis. There are so many uh, different ways, an economic crisis and a business crisis. Um, and there are so many aspects of it. And it would be really interesting and worthwhile to know how many of these were looked at and what the trade-offs were. Everything has been concentrated on COVID, understandably in a way, but um, actually the number of deaths as far as people, the number of people, the proportion of people who've actually died of COVID is very, very tiny. I think uh, I last figure I saw was uh, for the beginning of September, but it's something like 0.1%. And there is just so much evidence that would help to put things into perspective and help people to decide what they uh, might be able to do better. So first of all, find out what happened. And then secondly, I think what we need to do or what an inquiry needs to do without apportioning blame is seeing what people think. Obviously, they'll have some hindsight and that things will have changed as the pandemic continues. Find out what people think they could have done that. For example, could there have been more um, involvement of groups um, like sometimes local government? I mean, you keep getting stories of local government not even being told they're being locked down uh, before, uh, uh, let alone consulted about it. Uh, has was business adequately consulted? What about mental health? I mean, that's clearly uh, is something that's been increased crisis. That's something that and should, it seems to me, have been considered. And the need to be, or there has needed to be, no doubt there has been, but to what extent, what are the trade-offs between deciding on the, the good effects of having a lockdown, the lives saved, and the devastation of lives because people have got no money, no jobs, they're full of anxiety, all these things, they're very difficult trade-offs to do, but were they done? How were they done? Who was involved? And one of the things it seems to me that might be useful is to explore ways in which more people, more, more groups could have been consulted or could have fed in their views to the decision-making uh, process. Seems to me that what we need in government very often is much more bottom-up and less top-down government, less telling 
people, this is what we're going to do, uh, and if you don't like it, we'll get, we'll get the police on you, we'll get the army on you. I don't think that is the way to engender trust. I don't think it's the way to engender cooperation. And I think that we may have a crisis of trust, particularly go forward as things become more difficult and people start suffering in some areas, at least from lockdown fatigue. So I think that's what we should be doing to look at lessons learned, at lessons that can be learned. I think it should be an ongoing process, but some strong recommendations would be good. And one of the things that I'm sure an inquiry would find is that we need much greater transparency. There is so often sort of either no proper answer from uh, government when you say, well, why have you done this? Why have we got a 10 p.m. curfew? Um, or uh, the secrecy, I mean, secrecy surrounding SAGE at the beginning was just enormous. And uh, why? Why? The, uh, the difficulties are understood. I think government would actually find its job easier. And I think people would benefit, ordinary people would benefit and would be sympathetic to understanding the difficult choices that have and how you balance one against the other and what evidence there is. Thank you very much. Um, a couple of strong themes coming out already, particularly um, accountability and blame not being the same thing. And um, also some really interesting points on what an inquiry should actually look like. And I'm keen to come back to that. Um, Catherine, I want to come to you next. You're the director of policy at the British Psychological Society, a participant on SPY-B, and you focus on how psychology should inform government decision making. And um, so what are the psychological underpinnings of accountability? And do you agree this, um, that blame is the enemy of accountability? Um, and what does best practice tell us about how to balance that desire to blame with the need to learn? And what does that all mean for, for tackling COVID-19? Over to you. Thanks, I'll give that a go. Um, so as psychologists, we, we like to think about both the individuals uh, and the context or the environment that, that they operate in. So we, we think about systems, but focus on kind of the people um, at every part of that system in terms of policy and decision making processes. So I want to briefly consider what accountability looks like at those different levels. I want to talk a little bit about the psychology of surrogate decision making and how that's different um, sort of when you're making decisions for yourself. A bit about the conditions in which decisions are being made at the moment and the use of evidence and a bit about the role of kind of psychological safety, which is picks up a little bit on, on what other panellists have, have talked about in terms of kind of culture. Um, and then to reflect on what that means in terms of a, a future inquiry. So when we are making decisions on behalf of others, so a good decision making, we think differently. Um, and there are a number of factors that, that come into play here. Uh, this can include distance. So how far physically are we from those who are impacted by a policy, mm -hmm. but also what that means in terms of relative privilege and economic terms. So there's questions about whether our policymakers represent um, the communities that they're serving. And then there's a bit around our psychological understanding of risk perception in terms of numbers of people impacted by a disaster or, or a disease in this case. So in thinking about that, we need to confront what uh, Professor Paul Slovich calls the deadly arithmetic of compassion. And that's that the more people who die, the less we care. And that's a concept we know as kind of psychic numbing. So we all, indivi all value individual lives greatly, but those when lives kind of lose their value in the face of greater threats. And then there's also a really serious empathy gap. So psychological research shows us that our ability to take another person's perspective with any sense of accuracy is actually really small. And that means that the decisions that we make on behalf of others, we can get them completely wrong. And also we can miss the emotion that's involved in those decisions. So, you know, one of the examples is if you think even about doctors who are working kind of face to face with patients, we know that they can underestimate the pain that that patient is in. So you can imagine the challenge um, in terms of empathy and with, for policymakers with people that they will never meet in circumstances that have never occurred before. And so I think a lesson here for the COVID inquiry is to think about how and when to involve those people whose lives have been impacted by this pandemic. So th there's a moment now where we're thinking about, you know, will this inquiry be focused on procedure and on process or will it be asking people how it felt? What could have been done to reduce their anxiety? What could have been done better in terms of communication and managing some of those messages for the public? And then I think it's also really 
important not to underestimate the, the stress of actually working in government. Um, we've got a report out today, which is about the kind of psychological strain on, on parliamentarians, MPs and staffers. And that can have a serious impact on your decision making ability. So that's really thinking about how you need to understand that environment and the stress that it brings in order to develop a workplace and a workplace culture, which is positioned to support that democratic functioning and as a result, lead to the best policy outcomes and the best decisions. <laughs> And we know that there are some challenges around accountability and, and how do we incorporate that into a process where we can foster learning rather than blame? And this is where I'd like to bring in the concept of psychological safety. So it's a term devised by Professor Amy Edmondson, who's a psychologist at Harvard. Um, and she explains it as a belief that you will not be punished or humiliated for speaking up with ideas, questions, concerns or mistakes. The belief that you will not be exposed to a threat to yourself, your identity or your status in the workplace by raising concerns. So it's about the environment. And we know that people struggle to speak up in normal working environments. So by adding that political dimension and that pressure and the, you know, the, the kind of scrutiny um, and the kind of public um, microscope um, and media attention will make that dimension even more difficult. And so in practice, Best practice in most workplaces means framing challenge as a kind of learning exercise, having leaders that acknowledge fallibility and who model kind of professional humility and curiosity. And it means having leaders who can say, you know, why not? Why didn't you come to me to raise that concern? But I wonder what it is about my behavior or about the structures at play here that prevented that challenge from being heard. So it's about flipping that question to be about the culture rather than about individual blame and, and responsibility lower down the ranks, basically. And this is where you do see um, good practice like the, the MOD's reasonable challenge guidance, companies who work with this kind of culture of red teams uh, and, you know, the operational methodology in airlines that encourages pilots to challenge their captains. And, and um, Bernard mentioned before around kind of air, air traffic control and things and, and those kind of um, organisations who are really good at challenge. And it's also important to note that psychological safety isn't necessarily something that builds up over time. And in fact, some of the best examples of teamwork come from teams that have established um, really rapidly in response to a crisis. And that sort of, you know, we can draw similarities here with the fact that in response to coronavirus, you would have new teams coming from different parts of the civil service working together for the first time. So we're at this stage now where, where the government will be thinking about the terms of reference for this inquiry. So as I said, you know, you can either go technical and think about procurement decisions, process mapping, or you could go bigger and think about what kind of systemic change needs to happen. We probably need to do a bit of both, to be honest. But I think a big recommendation for us from the, the British Psychological Society is that it needs to include not just what decisions were made and by who and what happened, but also that wider context about what the context that those decisions were made in? What is the culture around those decision makers? Were the people able to operate from a place of psychological safety? Did people feel they could raise concerns without fear that they would lose their jobs or did they fear they would be scapegoated? And as I'm also representing the uh, a scientific psychological discipline here, I'd also extend that to the culture of use of evidence um, and how kind of challenge concerns and ideas from scientists and experts were heard and were listened to. And did we see that kind of professional humility and curiosity around the evidence base that would have enabled the best use of, of that evidence? How can we improve that in future, I think, is a really important question um, to ask. And how can we develop a system around evidence use that responds quickly to gaps, um, is able to kind of harness some of that, um, the, the evidence from the wider system and use that rapidly to sort of answer some of these big questions and then be able to kind of communicate how their evidence was found and used. I think that's a really important part of that accountability question. Um, yeah, and so I think that those are some of the, the big challenges and the big questions that we would have from, from a psychological perspective. Thanks. Brilliant. Catherine, thank you very much. Um, and thanks to the whole panel for those very insightful opening remarks. A quick reminder to the audience, if you've got any questions based on what you've heard so far, then please do submit them via the Q&A function and I will start asking some of those questions shortly. And um, before then, I've got some questions for the panel myself. Um, 
it's the whole panel essentially said blame is the enemy um, of accountability. We've heard that effective organisations are constantly learning. Catherine, you talked about the concept of psychological safety. I suppose my question is, what needs to change in Whitehall um, to make that kind of culture possible? Because it feels quite a far cry from where we are today. Um, Bernard, can I come to you first on that? Well, I'm afraid the, the blame culture in Whitehall extends from Parliament. And I think one of the challenges for select committees is to work out how parliamentary committees can actually scrutinise in a more positive and forward-looking way. Mm. So that when officials and ministers come to select committees, they feel they're coming to a, 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 a friend who's going to help them do their job better and not someone who's trying to catch them out or destroy them. Um, and I mean, there's nothing like um, public scrutiny or in a, within a department to raise the temperature and the anxiety. Um, and uh, we live in a very sort of goldfish bowl political environment, 24 seven news coverage, and, which I think has intensified these, these feelings. And I think that's got to be counteracted, but really in the, in the end in Whitehall, there is no substitute for thinking about uh, what the values of your leaders are. And that, min that includes ministers and officials. I think this, this idea that ministers and officials aren't in it together, they are, and, and this constant narrative that tries to set um, the politicians against the official, I think is extremely destructive and unlikely to produce the kind of atmosphere that we want. Thank you. Sue, did you want to come in? Yeah, I think, I think I, again, I absolutely agree with what Joe uh, says, and we do have the scene, it gets worse, and temperature sort of civil sisters against each other or Sue, I think your connection's a bit unstable. Catherine, I might come to you just while um, Sue's uh, connection stabilises. Sure, I mean, I think there's a... Oh. <laughs> there's a couple ahead, of things here where I think, you know, we, it, we need to oh, take... Some I... Sorry, so you cut out for a minute. Um, so I'm just coming to Catherine, then I'll come oh, back I'm to so you. I'm so sorry. Catherine. Okay. So, uh, yeah, so it's just that there's, you know, I think what we've got to do is... is there's two, two elements I'd, I'd highlight. So one is around taking that question around psychological safety in Parliament really seriously. And I think, you know, while, you know, we don't want to be all the poor MPs and, you know, make sure that, you know, that sort of perspective, but it really is important to make sure that, you know, those systems are in place, that, you know, people examine that culture really seriously. And, you know, there are, you know, tried and tested occupational psychology methods of, of doing that, you know, and it's partly about induction, it's partly about peer support, it's partly about, you know, the the way that, um, you know, as Bernard says about how you frame a select committee and how that, how witnesses feel that they're, you know, they're being questioned. Is it is it from a sort of um, place of conflict or from a place of actually learning? And I think that's really important. And then I think there's also kind of, elements around kind of psychologically informed training around you know how to um, bring some of those practices and procedures that would provide support for kind of identifying stresses and inappropriate workplace behaviors you know bullying and harassment and things like that they all contribute to this this culture and I think addressing all of those things at those different levels is really important. Thank you. Sue? Uh, I, can you hear me? I'm... Yes you are. Can you hear me? Yep, yep, I can hear you too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I thought what we were doing was about training. I thought thing about training was uh, particularly interesting. And I also think uh, what I was saying before is that because the pandemic, it doesn't, it cannot really start off by saying, well, it's your fault. I think it might be an opportunity for ministers and civil servants to work together on the what more evidence could we have got, what more uh, uh, forum could we have opened to trade on. I also think when it comes to decision making, and this is a general point, but I think it's very true when you've got the sort of hard decision got to be taken in a pandemic, that there should be much more general training for servants and for ministers on 
taking decisions, making sure you've got all the evidence together as possible, finding the right in order to decision should surely be sort of a not people against each other. Thank you. I just want to continue on this balancing blame and accountability for, for one more question. Um, when you have a really big mess up, for instance, like the testing number um, problems that we're hearing about um, today, what do you do in the kind of culture um, that's being described? Does somebody need to be held accountable um, or is there a different way of approaching that problem? Who wants to jump in first? Well, well I can somebody's jump in. got to be accountable. Sorry, Jess Berman. I'll stop you, Sue. Sue, go ahead. Sorry, I thought it was a, people need to be accountable to our But it does. And why? But again, it's um, always the accountable. And it doesn't mean that. It shouldn't mean that. I don't know what the difficulties were with the some of the testing and, and trace things. Because um, nobody's very clear about, is it a short equipment? What is it? Uh, it's very to pin down. I think this one area where quite often, really useful, particularly for somebody who is in inquiring into what happened, have some experts in, for example, logistics or in, for example, statistics people who could because we throw statistics around in the middle of this pandemic and you know, they're never put into context you don't know it's a big number you don't know it's bad good terribly worried and i i think that very if you had who could what might have been done, what the issues were to start with produce the evidence that would be really really helpful for everybody concerned Thank you. Bernard? Um, I think it's instructive to try and imagine what's been going on in the Department of Health for the last sort of 48 hours while they've come un uncovered this. Mm. It's really certain that there will have been people in the organisation that knew something bad like this was happening, but didn't feel able to explain it to their superiors. Um, and as it's been uncovered, there will be a tremendous, it's a very natural human reaction to feel anger about something that is embarrassing like this. But let us not lose sight of the, the quality of what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Accountability can only be attached in our system to ministers. Um, we hold civil servants accountable for certain things, like um, the accounting officers, but accountability is different from responsibility, which is uh, um, under the accountable minister, uh, different civil servants might have been given responsibility for certain things, but that's a kind of internal accountability. It's different from, from parliamentary accountable accountability to parliament. Um, and within that framework, um, uh, one hopes that uh, if the Secretary of State says, gets up this afternoon and I'm going to the statement in 15 minutes time, he, I hope he will say, I take full responsibility for this. I take, I take full accountability for this because uh, that is his role. Um, and then he will engender the respect and loyalty of his officials. I rather suspect saying there's some technical computer error is, a, try, a, try, a, is another way of just saying um, nobody could have known about this and it's an accident and it has no explanation um, beyond some technical. Well, somebody, somebody will have had responsibility for making sure it didn't happen, but maybe they were put under too much pressure or they didn't mm -hmm. have Sources. What is absolutely certain, it's almost, I mean, it's almost, you can completely dismiss the possibility that somebody did it culpably, on purpose, wantonly, intentionally to wreck. And therefore, yeah, yeah. there is no case for blame. There is no case for blame. It's everybody's fault and nobody's fault. Um, but what, what you want is an atmosphere in which the truth will come out as quickly as possible so it can be put right as quickly as possible. Thank you. 
Catherine. Well, and I just think that what I was sort of reflecting on is that you, depending on kind of how you run your inquiry and, and who runs the inquiry and what kind of questions are asked, you'll get to different answers. And I think where kind of where we would be pushing for a more kind of psychological approach, we would be thinking about not just kind of who was in the who was in the room while the decisions were made, you know, but who, how did they feel about bringing that you know um that evidence or that problem up and escalating and, and what was stopping them if they felt they couldn't so you would get those questions around culture as well as the sort of you know procedural what happened and I think there's there's two elements of that I think you know that sense of kind of the pressure understanding kind of workload and understanding you know if the person who was responsible for making sure the test number was right had been working 16 hour days for 16 days you know I imagine their ability to make that decision and to feel that they could you know to have that kind of robustness to escalate it and be able to then deal with it is going to be very different if they're you know fresh on the shift that morning kind of thing. Thank you and then one more question on the civil service before we move on to talking about the inquiry itself and um, do you think that the the current reforms of the civil service that are being proposed the kind of hard rain that's coming is that um is that supportive of the kind of culture that we're describing um or do you think it could be a challenge for it sue bernard i'm wondering whether one of you wants no. to um into this first <laughs> i don't think it's helpful under the heading civil service reform they say uh, what it means is moving civil service jobs into constituencies seems to be what uh, cummings and co want to do battering the civil service blaming them constantly uh, saying how dreadful they are and tax and more of them is absolutely the wrong way to go about getting better results well i would just make, make two Bernard points speaking, one is i'm not sure sorry I, i'm speaking now but um uh, I, I would just make two points one is a, a, a general one which i agree with uh, sue about which is uh the way that some ministers talk about civil servants reform seems to start from um, an excoriation of not just the system but the individuals in the system and their attitudes and their values now if the values and attitudes and behaviours of civil servants are wrong, well, let's start addressing that and talking about that. But, but then what they do is they talk about structures and locations and, and hard skills like commercial skills or technical skills. There is, an, uh, there is no discussion about values, attitudes and behaviours mm -hmm. and no virtually no mention of the word leadership. But there's something wrong with the civil service today um, and this is perhaps where I would make a criticism of the civil service. There is a complacency in the leadership that somehow they keep being told by the Blavatnik School for Government that they're the best in the world. Uh, funnily enough, it's funded by the civil service. Um, and um, uh, they comfort themselves that they are the best in the world and therefore everything goes wrong. It's down to the politicians. The question is, how does the civil service as an institution think of itself? in a situation where the politicians are divided and conflicted and they've got to provide the best advice. It's no good saying, it, saying oh, well, uh, the way they decided to go about this wasn't our idea and we're therefore not responsible for the outcomes. Um, I'm afraid the attitude to the, of the civil service over Brexit, yes, it definitely wasn't the civil service's idea over Brexit. Uh, but once Brexit had been decided upon, it seems that the civil service has been very far away from imagining the best kind of Brexit. They've sort of had their... Uh, hand on the handbrake the whole time, trying to slow down the process rather than facilitating ministers to the best kind of decisions. Now, that's a very big ask and getting into a controversial area. But I think the civil service has got some questions to ask itself, just as much as the politicians finish up with the civil service we deserve by the way we treat it. Thank you, Bernard. Um, really helpful answer. Oh, sorry, Sue, did you want to come back in? Yeah, I mean, I don't think I know it. And I'd say that seeing the lens of messages is helpful, I'm afraid. And I think the civil service does what it's always done, sometimes uh, does it better than others, but uh, it does what its ministers tell it. Um, and if things go wrong, I think there needs to be much more of a sense that ministers and servants are in it. Ever. I'm as guilty as using the words impartial and neutral.
and writing about the civil civil service isn't new. It's impartial because it will work with the Labour government, a Tory government, any government that the people elect. And once that government's it's on their side, it's there to support them for as long as they're in power. I think what you need is much more recognition of this by ministers and much more attempts to work together. Thank you. Before I go to audience questions, there are just a few um, questions I have on the inquiry itself. Um, Sue, you know, you made the case for an inquiry taking place in six months, getting to the truth as quickly as possible so we can actually learn from that. Um, Catherine, uh, do you agree? Uh, do you think that the best way for a public inquiry is something short and sharp? Or based on your experience as a behavioural scientist, should we be looking at something different? Do we just I have to have one? That's a, I think you know. I think where where we find good, you know, and I think it's so big and it's affected so many elements of society that you know we could have a we could have an inquiry just about vaccine development. We could have an inquiry about procurement. We could have an inv uh, inquiry about borders. You know, and, and international collaboration. I think what a really good place to start would be asking you know part of why we have inquiries is about you know accountability and responding to the public so I think a really important stage in this process would be to ask people what they what questions they have unanswered and what they would really like to see from um from an inquiry and I think the answers that you'll get from those who have been you know unable to hug their grandma for six months will be very different um to the questions that you know senior civil servants might have so that would be absolutely where I would start. Brilliant thank you and um Bernard one of the other points that uh, Sue made was the importance of of transparency um in your experience as a committee chair does there need to be a balance between things that should be shared in confidence and things that should be aired in public to get to the truth of the matter? Well, I think the importance of, if there was to be a, a quick inquiry now, it would have to be very focused and very short and very to the point. And it'd be very different from the inquiry that we would have after this event. The point of having an inquiry after the event is to have something much more reflective. And I like the idea of, of inviting the public to reflect on what they want from the inquiry before you actually do the inquiry. Too often public inquiries are organized by government to delay the accountability that they fear. So the Iraq okay, inquiry yeah. being the case of uh, which went on for years and years and years. Um, the, um, I, I think the, in answer to your question, the, um, uh, which I now can't remember, just remind me. <laughs> I was asking um, about the balance between sharing information in confidence right, uh, during the uh, inquiry uh, versus airing things in public. Right. There's a very strong argument, and I've conducted select committee inquiries in this way as well, is you do a great deal of work in private um, and in private conversation because you need to have the trust of the people you're inquiring into in order to be able to, be able to tell you stuff. And what you get from them in public needs to be informed by what they've told you privately, but is not necessarily going to be made public. Our inquiry into the relationship between ministers and officials was conducted on, almost entirely on the basis of private interviews. Mm -hmm. And that was the most important part of the evidence. So yes, you have to respect that people work in um, um, envelopes of trust, um, which can't be breached, or if they are breached, they're very, very carefully um, shared so that the because a trust made, you know, it's, conversations made public uh, are not in trust. Um, and to, to get the best out of an inquiry, a, a great deal needs to happen behind the scenes as well as in public. Thank you. Um, Catherine, did you want to come back um, yeah. on anything there? OK, brilliant. Um, so I think I'm just going to spend a bit of time on audience questions now. So the first question we've got in from the audience is, yeah. Is, is ministerial responsibility fact or fiction uh, today? Who wants to go first on that one? <laughs> Sue, would you like to go on that one? I think it's probably action. I don't think that uh, ministers meetings sometimes are uh, really responsibility for their, their, they're the ones who it's not and you get uh, evading and avoiding uh, straight on. I mean, the 
public's well aware when they do it. It doesn't really get them very far. Do it. And I quite what you do about it, I don't know. I think that when you get occasionally they do, when you get ministers who say, Well, maybe I should have done done that differently, looking back, maybe we should be doing X and Y and Z instead of this. I admit that I didn't get that right. I give people huge uh, respect among the public. Gosh, he's not like a politician. I think they should do more. I think the public would be much more sympathetic them, because I think very often there's not understanding among the public of the hard choices that ministers, governments have to make. You know, you're going to disappoint somebody and, and they're all good causes. And I think much better ministers were more open, more different and more honest. And also, I think trying, as it were, to take the public into their confidence. One of the things that's been notable about uh, the pandemic, difference in the wrangling it between uh, Nicola Sturgeon, I'm not a fan of the SNP, as her uh, for handling the pandemic are much, much higher. I think they were about 70%, and Boris Johnson were 30%. And I think it's because she is much more willing, certainly in her manner, to be open and to say, this is difficult, this is what I find it difficult and people appreciate it makes them feel that they're included thank you bernard um i think uh, well accountability is a constitutional act um but what you see visibly is probably very different from what people experience uh, someone who tries to um make uh, accountability felt i can sometimes feel very impotent uh, talking to people who feel they're being held accountable, they find it a very grueling and sometimes very painful experience. Uh, one experience I had was a, a, as a select committee chair was being told by a special advisor, you have no idea what effect it has on the part of the department uh, relevant to the inquiry you've just announced. You know, it has an electrifying, galvanizing effect. Um, on the officials and the minister, and they realise they're going to come under the spotlight. So don't always imagine that you will see the effects of accountability all the time uh, for, for it to be having an enormous influence over the way people behave and the way they respond uh, to the public and to Parliament. Thank you. Catherine? So one of the things we're doing at the British Psychological Society is thinking about kind of how we bring you know, psychological evidence into policymaking. And one of the things that's really important is, is thinking about the fact that, you know, policymakers are people too, you know, and, and that's where there are things you can do with any anybody in terms of um, ministers and, and other policymakers around increasing their own sense of connection and their sense of accountability to those they serve. So to come back to some of those points that I mentioned in my, my opening remarks around empathy and you know distance and psychological distance and physical distance and I think one of the ways to kind of increase that ministerial accountability and that sense of accountability is, is to try and connect people with the you know the publics that they're serving and that you know there's various ways of doing that in the first one but you know i think that's where you get that sense of and i think that's happened a bit during coronavirus is, is ministers and have seemed quite distant from the, the people that they're working with and some of those decisions i mean that you know quite disconnected and i think that's partly where the accountability gap is is coming from thank you um, another question from the audience. How can inquiries best have impact? And this is actually a question very close to the heart of the Institute for Government. We've done a lot of work in this space as well. Um, and, you know, have found that often inquiries do these incredible detailed processes, come up with lots of fascinating recommendations, but those recommendations often aren't implemented. So how does the panel think uh, we can best ensure that an inquiry into coronavirus actually leads to change? Uh, Catherine, sorry, but you just started with perhaps. I think one of the, you know, again here is, is you know, it, it's it's about follow up, isn't it? And it's about people who are you know psychologically yeah, yeah. invested and emotionally invested in the outcome. So if you think about an inquiry like Grenfell, 
you know, the fact that the families um, who were affected have been, you know, closely following that inquiry and making sure that, you know, that those recommendations are followed up. And I think that that's where, you know, where involving the public in a, in a coronavirus inquiry would have the same sort of impact is that you'd need, you know, obviously all of the public have been affected in, in some way. So it's about finding ways to use that for accountability, follow up, and then also, you know, structural follow up within within parliamentary procedures is also really important. Sue, Sue did you want to come in? Yeah. I, I, I absolutely agree with that. I think Institute for a uh, Government figure that since in the last 30 years, been six, eight inquiries, only six uh, proper follow-ups by select committees. I mean, it's just amazing. I think, uh, as Catherine says, you really do need to have, have um, a follow-up. I think also that, um, not quite sure how you do this, I guess in terms of reference, you need to make the inquiry people pretty disciplined don't let them make n numbers of uh, uh, recommendations there's got to be a number that people can deal with and that can be pursued and that do have some sort of a ranking order uh, I have to go immediately unfortunately but i think given elect committees i don't know things would be really good well, right, to say I I would just say two things about about inquiries. First of all, however the relevant recommendations may be, unless they engage all the parties, so that there is assent for those recommendations at the end of the process, then the inquiry will be wasted. So engagement, particularly with victims. Thank you so much. I've got to Thank go you to very you. much, Bernard. Bye. 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 Sue, sorry. Not at all. Uh, I should have let Bernard uh, go first. Um, no, I think that it is really important to have a committee example, but, but select an old way of following up on uh, recommendations and finding out what happens. Not too often, this just um, isn't done. And I agree with what Catherine was saying. Maybe you do need more of an inquiry. I certainly think that. Uh, what I was suggesting was a short, sharp inquiry that will come up with some suggestions for recommendations that we can do now or in the next six months. But I think I agree with her that it's very important that individuals who have suffered, uh, sometimes, you know, there'll be heart-rending stories, people who couldn't see their loved ones, couldn't say goodbye to them. All, all these uh, terrible stories be a forum, an inquiry, what where people can record what happened and what they feel as a result, including what they think might have helped them as individuals. And I, again, it's more this bottom-up um, uh, advice on policy making, getting all people's views, how they were affected, and sometimes if they've got ideas, what they think would have helped them that can be used in the future. Brilliant. Thank you, Sue. We are very almost at half past now, so I think I'm going to have to um, draw this discussion to, uh, to a close. Um, it was an absolutely fascinating discussion. I'm glad we got to talk a lot about what accountability means in practice, as well as uh, what a, an inquiry into coronavirus should look like. So thank you very much, um, Sue, Catherine, and although Bernard has gone, thank you very much to Bernard too. I hope um, those involved in considering a public inquiry into coronavirus and indeed thinking about civil service reform are listening to this. <laughs> um, we'll make a video and audio podcast available on our website of this event as soon as possible. Um, until then, thanks to our panellists. Thank you to the British Psychological Society for supporting this event. Um, and thank you to you, the audience, for listening in. Thank you very much. <laughs>